going to sing the goodness of God. Hello and welcome. You found the weekly Bible study from Corinth Baptist Church in Singleton, Mississippi, and I'm glad you're here. The title of today's Bible study is The Pitfall of Temptation. This will be our the second of six studies under the general heading of how to avoid life's pitfalls. 
Last week, we established that a pitfall was a trap. Far too often, pitfalls are traps that we create for ourselves in the way that we react to them. Let's talk about this word temptation for a moment. It's a noun. Synonyms of temptation include desire, urge, impulse, inclination, enticement, appeal, attractiveness, and fascination, and that's just to name a few. Temptation includes both the situation of being tempted and of tempting others. And while not all temptation are actually evil, most are. Satan, in the Garden of Eden, was doing evil when he used his wiles to tempt Eve to partake of that forbidden fruit. Eve was doing evil simply by entertaining the idea of partaking of that fruit. Look, it wasn't simply the act of taking the fruit that was sinful, but the mental attention that she gave to the possibility of disobeying her Creator. It's just so very hard for any of us to guard against the hidden thoughts and the impulses of our own minds. The temptation to sin is often exciting and compelling on the front end, but afterwards we face the consequences of giving in and see our sin for an entirely, from an entirely different perspective. It's in the aftermath that we often ask ourselves with regret, why did I give in? Why did I do that? Thank goodness we have the guidance of God's Holy Spirit within us, okay? With His help, we can move beyond temptation and make the right choices. That old hymn, it's, it's like that old hymn says, I need thee, oh, how I need thee. I need thee every hour. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. In our English today, I need you. Oh, I need you. I need you every hour. Temptations lose their power when you are close. Amen. As we continue into this study today, we're going to see Joseph's Joseph determined in his mind not to sin against God, his Egyptian master, nor even himself. So let's read our first section of scripture for today. It comes out of Genesis chapter 39. It's verses 1 through 7. Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. An Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guards bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor with his master and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed him and placed all that he owned under his authority. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. The Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in his fields. He left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now, Joseph was a well-built and handsome. Okay, Joseph was well-built and handsome. After some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, Sleep with me. Now, 
Do y'all recall the conversation that God had with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12? It was in verse 3 that I'm going to read to you. I will bless those that bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. I believe that this promise was a perpetual promise from God, one that included all of Abraham's descendants. Potiphar was blessing Joseph for his dedication and his loyalty, and in turn, God was blessing Joseph's master. Joseph had been betrayed by his brothers, sold to the Ishmaelites as a slave, taken to Egypt, and sold there to a man named Potiphar. The Bible says that this Potiphar was an Egyptian officer and the captain of the guards. To have risen to such a high and trusted position in the service of Pharaoh speaks volumes about this man. He most clearly would have had the ability to accurately size people up quickly. Now granted, God had a reason for the way everything was going to happen in the life of Joseph. And I'm sure God's influence was on Potiphar that, fa that fateful day. But there must have been that little something that Potiphar picked up on that moved him to purchase Joseph from these Ishmaelites in the first place. Potiphar's instincts were right. Over the course of time, Potiphar continued to see that he had made a good choice in per procuring this young man. That little something that he had seen in Joseph was the hand of God that was upon him. With God's blessing, it seems that everything Joseph did worked out in the best possible way. Potiphar was no fool. He observed jo Joseph's work ethic. But as equally important, Potiphar saw Joseph's devotion to the Lord. It was through these observations that Potiphar saw that Joseph could indeed be trusted. He elevated Joseph to the position of his personal attendant. As Joseph continued to be a, a source of prosperity for the Egyptian household, Potiphar added Joseph added to Joseph's authority until everything that Potiphar had from his household to his herds to and even to his fields were placed under him and in all areas under Joseph's authority the result was prosperity. In spite of the fact that Joseph was still a slave his life was bursting at the seams with his success. But often, it's, it's when we're on top of the world that we find ourselves tempted to do or even think of doing things that we ought not. It's a time when we must be very careful to guard against temptations that likely will come, in, come at us from every direction. The Bible says that Joseph, being in his prime, was well-built, and handsome. Enter Potiphar's wife. Joseph's good looks hadn't escaped her notice. She began to lust for Joseph. When she couldn't keep her feelings to herself any longer, she began to proposition this good-looking young man. The story continues in Genesis chapter 39 verses 8 through 10. But he refused. Look, he said to his master's wife, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in this house, and he has put all that he owns under my authority. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. So now, so how could I, I do the cement's sin? 
And how could I, how could I do this immense evil? And how could I sin against God? Although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with that woman, to go to bed with her. There's no doubt that Joseph walked with God. His personal standards and convictions were already well in place. His moral compass was aligned with the goodness and rightness, the righteousness of God. Our moral standards are our early warning system when temptations rear up before us. Joseph didn't know what it would mean for the Spirit of God to actually be indwelling a person's very soul. That wouldn't happen until the day of Pentecost after Jesus had returned to heaven nearly 1,800 years into the future. We born-again Christians have that extra layer of protection in our person in the person of the Holy Spirit who's dwelling within us. That little voice that speaks to us warning us about situations we're confronted with is nothing more than the Holy Spirit. How very blessed we are. Amen. Praise God. With His presence in our lives along with our clear convictions embedded in our minds and hearts, we have all the tools we need to respond to the temptations in a way that pleases the Lord. Joseph responded to Potiphar's wife clearly and decisively as he refused her invitations, repeated invitations. His rejection to her offer only strengthened her resolve. Joseph tried to reason with his lady, his master's wife. He tried to make her see the trust her husband had placed in him. The woman wanted Joseph to be her sexual partner only for the moment. But Joseph challenged her to see that Potiphar had taken her to be his wife for life. He pointed out to her that she needed to see herself as her master's wife and the limited reach of the authority that had been given to Joseph himself. His master had withheld nothing from him, yet Potter, Potiphar had deemed his wife to be out of bounds out of the bounds of Joseph's authority. That limitation underscored the elevated place Potiphar's wife had in his life. So Joseph had no choice but to view a sexual relationship with her as nothing less than an immense evil. Joseph relayed to her how God viewed inf infidelity. For God, infidelity is something that violates the order that he's laying out from the very start. Infidelity breaks God's heart. Joseph rightly judged that having a sexual relationship with her was nothing less than a sin against God. Joseph knew the value of nurturing his convictions and standards and living them out every day. Accepting her invitation would have threatened his position with his master and violated the sanctity of marriage. But worst of all, it would have fractured his relationship with the Lord. Joseph's refusal to be tempted by her didn't change her mind at all. Her obsession with her lustful longing for him made her turn a deaf ear to the truth regarding her illicit intention. She was relentless in propositioning him. Every day he could expect her to approach him with the same invitation. The resolve Joseph demonstrated could have only come from his devotion to the Lord. But before temptations ever came to him, 
Joseph had embraced solid convictions that guided the moral choices that he made. The temptation to sin almost always carries a, a, a powerful allure with the promise of satisfying some want or some need. But as we know, what's promised and what's delivered are very often quite different. Psalm 46 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever present help in trouble. Look, God wants us to depend on Him for everything. He loves caring for us. The next section of Scripture in our study today is Genesis chapter 11, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 39, verses 11 and 12. Now, one day He went into the house to do His work. And none of the household servants were there. She grabbed him by his garment and said, Sleep with me. But leaving his garment in her hand, he escaped and ran outside. With, Potiphar, with Potiphar's wife's persistent invitations, don't you know that one of Joseph's strategies was to be sure that other household servants accompanied him as much as possible? as he went about his daily duties in that home. There are many, many verses of scripture that urge us to flee from sexual immorality or any temptation for that matter and to flee to God. Just one example is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 18 and 19. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, Run from sexual immorality. Every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Sexual immorality is sin. Having sexual relations outside of the sanctity of marriage is fornication and it's sinful. Being married and having sexual relations with anyone besides your spouse is adultery. Having sexual relations with anyone that is married to another is also adultery. Any act of sexual immorality is not only a sin against God, it is a sin against your own body. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 we find this. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. They become one flesh? How is that possible? I've just finished reading an article online where it is proven that a couple in love, get, when they get close to each other, their heart beats and their, beating, and their breathing automatically synchronize. One flesh. I'll try to remember to add a, a, a link to the comments section below this video, okay? It's also proven that this doesn't happen with couples who aren't in love. With the Holy Spirit of God Himself dwelling within our very souls, our bodies are actually the temple of God. When we're tempted to have a sexual encounter outside of the sanctity of marriage, we not only grieve God's Holy Spirit, we desecrate His holy temple. Our Bible doesn't only tell us to avoid sexual immorality, it tells us to run from it. But our flight from that situation is useless unless we run to him. He's our strength and our resolve. So yes, Potiphar's wife most likely had dismissed all of the household servants that day. 
and it was most likely a trap that she had set to finally get the object of her lustful desire. But when she grabbed at him and demanded that he sleep with her, he did exactly what he should have done. He left her standing there with a piece of his clothing that she would, had been clutching in her hands, and he ran out of that house. This isn't the end of the story, not by a long shot. We'll pick it up from there in our, our next in our study next week. Now, I hope I've given some of y'all some very important things to meditate over in the Bible in our Bible study today. This seems like a good place to stop. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for every blessing that you give us. We're so undeserving of everything. We thank you for the gift of faith that you've given us to believe in you. We thank you, Lord, for coming into our hearts and filling us with your spirit as we turn to you in repentance and ask your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, for that quiet little voice that's inside of each of us as we navigate through the trials and the snares and the traps that are all around us in this world. Help us, Lord, to always, always turn to you whenever temptations come before us. And may you always speak the loudest to warn us when we're making our mistakes that we're going to be sorry for. Please watch over us and keep us over the next week, Lord, and help us to do the good works that you've prepared for us to do well in advance. We give you all the praise, and all the glory, and all the thanksgiving we know how, Almighty God. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching, and I'll try to have you another video up in about a week. Bye-bye for now.